What's up, what's up, what's up? I'm Brian Van Shaw. And I'm Corey. And we are back with episode number 13 of No Labels Necessary. Let's get it. You can find us anywhere. Spy, uh, with Spotify, Apple, wherever you listen to. And of course, here on YouTube, where we talk music, business, content, branding, and just have fun all around because we like to talk that shit. And today, we got quite a few interesting topics for you guys starting off as y'all know with this music stuff we like to get into a little bit of advice and i want to approach the advice a little different today Corey. okay i want to not just show the advice i want to ask y'all how do y'all feel about the advice whenever we show the advice segment i want to say i, I want it to be about how people actually feel about it right, right? Yeah. so it's like of course we will give our commentary but it's almost like rating it was this good advice or bad advice. Yeah, do you feel you know, like you can apply this? Do you feel like you can apply this? Does this Is it work too for general? You? What's your, what are your thoughts on it? Because we're going to share two advice clips today. So let's this be let number 13, episode number 13, be the way we kick this off. But today, starting it, it's going to be a piece of advice from none other than DDG. Hold on, let me do a quick little refresh. And I hate this. All right, he says, you got to treat the internet like a girl you want attention from. All right. Social media is a girl that you want attention from, right? Okay. If you don't give her attention, she going to start looking at other people. You get what I'm saying? So if you treat social media like that, like I got to stay in their face, it's like, how could they forget you? And then when you when you drop that hit song or whatever, you going to have the eyeballs to catch it rather than you, you know what I'm saying, not showing the girl attention. She not even paying attention when you're doing your lit shit. But if you keep them in your face, even if you fuck up, as long as you stay in their face, you still got a chance to get that, that smash. You know what I'm saying? Right. You... Mm. There we go. Wise words. Wise words. Wise words? <laughs> wise words. That's what we're going with. Wise words. Yeah, I, get, I, I, get, I get where he's going with the analogy. Okay. okay. I think I think the point behind it is a good point, too. Well, i say I noticed when he said if you don't give her attention, she's going to start paying attention to some, someone else. Mm-hmm. You kind of gave him a little, hmm preach <laughs> it's a little bit experience there, I mean, but... hey man you know bro i live the life you know what i'm saying <laughs> i'll be out here you know what i'm saying <laughs> he said preach brother man okay you know look, hit a little personal well yeah i want to hear you your breakdown how you feel about that analogy um and then i'll give you my thoughts <laughs> <laughs> so I, I all right all right stay with me here you know what i'm saying okay like i said i get what he's saying because we've talked a lot about how how fickle music consumers are, mm-hmm. right? They have a lot of choice. The choices are thrown at them very fast. And quite frankly, there are at least a hundred other things that are that could arguably be more important than whatever your thing is that they could be paying attention to. Right. So, yeah, you have to stay in their face, right? Like you're literally competing. And this is why I think a lot of artists start to kind of get it fucked up when it comes to social media stuff is like, you're no longer competing with just other music artists, right? You're competing with viral videos, news headlines, you know what I'm saying? IG model photos, bro. Like, it's just a vicious, vicious marketplace out there, right? Yeah. So, so the the artist, the person, the creator that can't consistently stay in people's face to keep some attention okay. when they finally have that big moment that comes around, you know what I'm saying? Like, you saying like there's not going to be anybody paying attention because you didn't baby step them to, that, to, the, to the point of the big moment. And I, I agree with that because I, the biggest thing that he said that I, I like out of that whole point where he was like, even if you're failing along the way, just the fact that you're in their face is still enough because you're keeping their attention, right? That makes me think about artists and their content, right? How many artists have we talked to? Like, I don't want to put this video out because I don't think it's perfect or it doesn't show me in a certain light or I don't right, think it's creative right, enough, right? right. right? Where he's literally saying like, yo, bro, like if it's good or bad, as long as it holds their attention, it has the potential to snowball and pile up to whatever that big moment or piece of thing is that you do want people to pay attention to. And you have to guide them to that. And I agree with that. Like, I 100% agree with that. Okay, so, one, I love how he did, how he ended it. He ended it like a rapper, (laughs) right? Or a a writer, you know, but he's a rapper. Did you notice how he ended it? No. Bringing the the analogy full, full, full. Circle. Oh yeah, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, bro. That, that yeah, smash. like that, bro. Yeah, yeah. I, I appreciate yeah. you know, the, the smash <laughs> hit single. You know yeah. what I mean? The smash. You know what I mean? Smash, smash. I like how you pulled that together. <laughs> that was that was very clever of you, DDG. Um, 
Ah, the analogy itself. So, have you ever approached a girl that you wanted to, you know, entertain or have entertain you and you didn't land on your feet at first? You yeah, know 100%. I mean? it, yeah, it wasn't as smooth yeah, as you bro. usually you know are. I'm saying? Like, ain't no shame in my game, bro. I took some L's, you know what I'm saying? I got some battle wounds. Do you have any L's, right, that became a W? Yeah, 100%. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so, I think in in that way, I've probably experienced that where, you know, girl wasn't feeling me for whatever reason at first, but because of the proximity, I'm not even saying that I was like trying to be in their face intentionally like music and all that stuff, but the proximity, you got to realize your initial perception of me was a lie. You know what I mean? Yeah, okay, I see yeah, you, you, you projecting yeah. your old stuff yeah. on me, man. I'm not that other dude. I'm actually some kind of special, you know what I mean? Yeah. I'm not worth, I'm worth the shot. So that proximity that I've personally experienced in the past, right? Whether it's like because of school or like working a job, we still have to see each other all that time, right? It creates that space to even evolve your opinion, yeah, right? Yeah. Which I think really plays into his analogy because one, you have those people that you win right off the bat. Mm-hmm. Two, you have those people that you don't connect with, whether it's they hate you or it's just they don't connect, yeah, right? Yeah. But then you give them more time and space to fall deeper in love with you. Now, of course, you could say the other way, People mess with you and they have time to start hating you. But that's a little bit rare, I find, especially like on a online experience. Like you yeah. got to really like turn the tide or you do something. Say some, say some shit or yeah, do some shit. Yeah, yeah. It has to be yeah. has to really go somewhere. So I can get with that analogy. I, I wasn't quite sure. I liked it on a surface level. <laughs> and then I said, but I wasn't sure when I started to think about it if I would like truly say, all right, I'll stand by it. Now I also am aware that there's probably some young women out there that feel like, hey, it's not like that. Like that's not, y'all y'all talking wrong about how the relationship is, and maybe how you know his wording might have been a little bit off. That I'm not here to say. All I'm saying is the elements of it, you know, have added up in my personal experience at times, and I think that definitely applies online. Yeah, but the audience that is going to hit with is, is going to hit. Yeah. With the, you know, the target demographic was reached, you know what I'm saying? Hey. Like, like when I saw the clip, that's how I felt. I was like, damn, this shit clicks, bro. Like it just <laughs> brought it all together. I had these words yeah. in my head, but I couldn't figure out how to express them. Right. Thank you, DDG. You know right. what I'm saying? Right. So yeah, bro, but that's what I hope artists take out of it. Like, hey man, like the net we said all the time the name of the game is attention. Yep. It's easy to get attention, is it's hard to maintain it. Yeah. And and keep people interested. Cause um, you you can't win the game without being seen, without being known. Yeah, bro. Right? I don't even know it yeah. exists. The whole like you know tree falling in the forest mm-hmm. shit. You can make the most amazing shit ever, but if I don't know about it, or if I didn't care enough about you to even, I guess, care to be aware that this thing is coming, which is I think one of the points he was making. Like, bro, you got to kind of put enough out there that people just like slightly care long enough that by the time you do hit them with the big thing, it just hits for them, right? Like they, like you said, it's like micro wins, right? Like, like I come into it. I'm not. I don't 100 percent love you. Maybe I'm three percent, but in every you know video you drop or something, I see if you add like one percent to it, one yeah. percent to it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And then the day you drop this thing, I'm at 80 percent, and I go check it out. And you got an extra however many people on here. And I mean, I think he's the right messenger for that message because I've said it a lot. I personally think he's one of the better content creators turned music artists. Um, and you can see a lot of the way that he maintains his audience is by. Doing a lot of the same shit he was doing when he was a YouTuber. He's still yeah. dropping vlogs. He's still posting, nice. you know, what I'm saying funny personality content on the different socials, and he's working the music artist angle into it. So I feel like it's a good messenger to to put that message out there. Yeah, I could I could get with that, and I'll say say this right. Those steps again. I I'm not gonna even say who, but I remember somebody I know being sleep on the floor. <laughs> When I walked into the room and I had just been in that room five minutes later, tell them they need to get up and they were on the bed. Yeah. And they were like, all right, I'll right, get up. Then I walked back in the room, they on the floor asleep. And I was like, yo, I thought you were getting up. <laughs> and he was like, the first step is getting out of bed. <laughs> he was like mumbling. He was like sleep talking. So <laughs> all that to say is same with the fan base. There's those steps that exist that you have to take people through. Mm-hmm. You can either like hop straight off the roof 
and and expect people to know you and love you immediately, or you can go the more sure route of just saying, "Hey, I need to be have people aware of me, and I need to stay there, mm-hmm. and eventually they'll they'll rock with me." It's very few times and moments where someone just like sees you and then they rock with you like on that next level. Yeah, just that shit like, gotta be amazing. Gotta be amazing. Or life changing right? for whatever like, reason. The song has to hit crazy or the video has to hit crazy or in real life, right? You might meet that person and there's that spark like immediately like, oh, this is something different. Yeah. Right? Whether it's just a friend, a homie, um, a girl, whatever it is. But we know that's not most people that you meet. It usually yeah. has to develop a little bit more even if you kind of like like their vibe. So I can see how it works in, in, in that way as well. I just say, hmm, I think the, I think, what's, the, how you term it? So that analogy of getting in people's face is, and staying in their face and to make them like you reminds me of the idea of indifference, right? It's like, at least being seen means they're on top, you're, they're top of mind. Mm-hmm. But if I'm indifferent to you, then I'm probably not even thinking about you. I'm mm-hmm. not bothered by you. I don't care. So, you know, I've, I've, I've been that guy where I've talked to a girl, oh, I hate you. Know, oh, I hate you. I'm like, all right, at least you're feeling something. We can work on that other, flipping that next time. But you're feeling science, something. Toxic. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, you know, I'm, I'm nowhere near that life anymore. But, you know, <laughs> I truly did add it up in my mind at that time. Like, at least they feeling something, yeah. right? That indifference, bro, that's a hard, you don't know what to do with that. Yeah. How do I manipulate, like, just actually not caring? Kanye, polariz- polarizing, I can use the people that hate me because they mm. making comments or they bringing it up. Yeah. I, and, and then they're creating something for the people who love me to attack and respond to. Yeah. People who aren't commenting. They're just not reading the stories. What do I do with that? Yeah, bro. You have no no control in that situation. No power in that situation. No power. Mm-hmm. No power. So uh I think we're gonna give that a we're gonna give that a W on that one. Give that a W. W W uh, metaphor. Yeah, yeah. On the on a metaphor. Let's let's see what we got next though. Advice number two. <laughs> oh yeah, this is a good one. This is a good one. Well, I've been waiting, waiting for this topic. It's been burning in my soul. Posted by <laughs> Kids Take Over. Shout out to Kids. Shout out to uh, Arshan. Arshan, yeah, Arshan dope platform. You should never put people on the spot to check out your music. They're always going to lie to you and be like, mm, okay, okay, that's kind of hard. You guys have been in this situation, right? And you can't say it's bad, right? Like, what do you honestly say? Because I've had, like, bigger artists play me their music in, in front of them, you know, and I definitely don't want to hurt their feelings. And you always want to have a good relationship with people in the music industry, right? What I do is, like, if they'll play me, like, four songs, I just won't say anything. And then for one of the songs, they'll be like, all right, this is the one I'm feeling, you know? Because at least then you're kind of complimenting them, but then you're also letting them know, like, those other songs, they weren't it. <laughs> you should never put people on the spot mm. to check out. How do you tell your rapper homie his music ain't it? How do you do it? I mean, the process he gave was actually pretty genius. I'm going to start using that. <laughs> like, to listen to four songs, pick one, and then be like, oh, yeah, bro, the C was hard, bro. Like, that's genius, bro. I usually don't want to get that deep into it. You know what I'm saying? If the music no. is genuinely bad. That's actually exactly what I do, bro. <laughs> that's exactly what I do. But I don't ask for it, right? <laughs> in, in, in those situations, if there's more than one, I will say, yeah, like that's the one, right? Because if that yeah. one has some redeemable um, qualities or that one actually is good and the other ones are bad. Because you know the trick, bro, right? No. You don't, you don't know the trick? I nah. mean, I got some tricks, nah. bro. But I got to I got to got multiple. Trick, t- all right, there's multiple tricks. But I'm not even talking about the trick with the artist feedback. But you know the trick on how we've talked about Sometimes somebody will send us a song and we'll be ready for the campaign and then they'll switch out the music. Oh, yeah. And we'll be like, what the hell? This yeah. isn't even the same artist. <laughs> it is the same artist, but like, how is this song so good and the rest of it doesn't sound like yeah. that? Yeah, Bill Jean like, what is this moment? What is this? <laughs> like, how is this the same person? All right. So when you have multiple songs, that's an opportunity that you get. But me, to be real, <laughs> I'm pretty straightforward with it, man. Like I, I will straight up say, like I think you need some development, but I can see where you're going with it. Mm. I can hear it. Like that mm. kind of Constructive thing. Constructive feedback. Yeah, I try to be. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he said this feedback. shit like it was so foreign. He was like, I never thought about that. <laughs> it's like, damn, constructive feedback, bro. My mind don't ever go there. <laughs> He was like, how can I just not tell him it's trash? Or how can I say this is good? Because, bro, constructive feedback is a lot of work. <laughs> like, to really... 
to add yeah. like true sincerity and thought into a constructive yeah. feedback that is a lot of brain power bro yeah <laughs> and sometimes I just don't have it in me because artist friends are bad about picking the worst moments to ask you for your opinion on shit. They're terrible about it, bro. Like that, that just be hype. It'd be three in the morning. You barely wait. Hey, bro, I just made this shit. Check it out. It's like, no, bro, I'm going to sleep. I don't even know why I'm responding back to you right now. You know what I'm saying? To be real with you. So <laughs> the fact that you mentioned friends, actually, hold that down. Just the base. Yeah, we'll okay. fix it. But the the fact that you said that um, friends, I forgot about that part. And if they if they're my friends, they definitely get into the real shit, man. It's, it's, it's no way they getting it harsh. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I like to pride myself on thinking that all of my music artist friends are really good. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't, I don't personally think I have a trash that, exactly music artist friend, which um, allows me to be even harsher when it's something like that's yeah. actually not even all that bad. But yeah. you know what I mean? <laughs> you can hit them with the "Hey, bro, it's cool, but you better than this." <laughs> Hey man, I like this, but yeah. I don't hate to be that guy, but it ain't the last thing you showed me, bro. <laughs> this ain't this ain't that. <laughs> and, but my biggest pet peeve with it is because personally, for me to give someone a good opinion on their music, I have to listen to it for at least like three times. Oh yeah. Because yeah, yeah. the first time I'm like just listening, just to listen. The second time I'm listening for like lyrics, and then the third time I'm listening for like the vibe of it. Yep. Now if I think this, if I truly think the song is trash, I'm not making it past listen number one. I'm mm-hmm. already trying to think of my finesse to get out of how I get, yeah, out, of I get out of this 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 yeah, thing you yeah. asked me to do. If I at least like it to it's good, yeah, at least two three more times. You know, so I can come back and say, I guess it is constructive criticism. Yo, bro, I think the hook is cool. Y'all can see this shit doing whatever, whatever. It wasn't really feeling the verse because I feel like, and this is what I do appreciate about all my artist friends. I feel like if you ask me for my opinion, you are giving me permission to tell you that you trash. Yeah. Because if you because if you didn't want me to possibly say that, you didn't have to ask me for my opinion. You know, I'm not a guy that's just out here slapping opinions around just because I feel like it. Well, I mean, I guess this is what this this podcast <laughs> this podcast is, but but not about shit like that. Like I'm not gonna just walk up to an artist and be like, Hey bro, I heard you playing that that song a couple of seconds ago. Yo, that's you? Yeah, right. yo, that shit was trash. Like, I'd I never do that, right? But yeah. they came like, hey, man, you heard me playing that song down in Studio B. What do you think about it? Hey, man, I might need, I need one or two more listens. So I, I haven't- What per- if you're at a show? Do you, do you believe in booing? Booing? Yeah. No, nah, but I do stand in the crowd and look at them very disappointingly. <laughs> because at some point, if they're a good artist, they're going to make eye contact with you at some point, and I, I want them to see the look of disappointment in my face. I mean, they probably are the good artists, though. You know what I mean? If you have to give them that face. That's funny, bro. That is actually hilarious. <laughs> just look at them dead in the like, eye. As soon as they're like, yeah, yeah. As soon as they make eye contact, I'm just like. <laughs> this, ain't, this ain't it, bro. This ain't it. Uh, I, that, I'll, I'll give them feedback on the actual performance. You know I might like? have to adopt that, bro. I, uh, bro it's beautiful. I used to <laughs> call it the single boo. Because literally, I would give them one boo. <laughs> like, I'm not trying to be rude and overtake the show. I just need enough for you to hear me and know that there's some discontent going on here. Yeah, They'll just be like boo. But that's yeah, too that's dangerous, it. bro. Because you don't want to be the guy that started the, that starts the boo. boo. Yeah, bro. Like, I don't. I don't want to be that guy. <laughs> you know, I've never. No one's ever. You know, followed. <laughs> it's been like people look at me like I'm crazy. Like usually, like my sister or somebody, but like, bro, you like. Cur- just like, no, I'm not trying to start nothing. <laughs> just just let them know that, hey, I'm not feeling this part. So I, you know, I think there's a there's there's a <laughs> <laughs> there's a synergy there. You got the face, I get a boo, right? So you got a visual, I gotta I just got a sound that yeah. I give them. But I, I haven't had to do that in years. You yeah. know, a very long time. Really, bro, it'd be, it be coming down to like context of the situation too, because now I probably get asked that question the most doing sales calls for like artists that are trying to work with the agency. Mm. And like that, you know, I got my whole way of getting out of that. You know what I'm saying? I got it's pretty genius. You know what I'm saying? I don't know if I should share my dark secrets. I don't think you should. <laughs> I, I actually don't think you should. <laughs> but, but when you hear it, bro, you will never know. But this is me basically being like, hey, man, that shit ain't it. Because there's also a part of me that sometimes can acknowledge that. What if I'm just not the target demographic, right? What if I think it's trash because it's not for me? I've been wrong before. I've been, yeah. you know, I've been very vocal in the agency about very. the amount of times I've been wrong. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, I'm cool with that, bro. Like, yeah. you know, like, so what if it just ain't for me? So I always think that in the back of my head, bro. Like, what if this isn't trash? What if I just don't like this? 
So I do try to give artists the benefit of the doubt. But if you ask me and I genuinely think it's trash, and like, I, would, I would preface it, but yo, like, you really want to know my my real opinion? <laughs> yeah. Like, are you sure? Like, yeah. Like, you, no matter where I go with it, you cool with it? Yeah, yeah. Okay, bet. And now let them know. It's like three three signatures on the contract, you know what I'm saying? Just to make sure <laughs> <laughs> that shit is signed, dotted, and all the T's across, bro. Before I, get the prompt. <laughs> yeah, before I tell you what I'm about to tell you. Because I don't know, man, bro. It's, it's nothing worse than being popped off on by artists that ask you that your opinion on the song and don't like what you had to say, bro. It's the worst. It's no. like, it's like, bro, well, I, I ain't, you asked me, bro. I didn't come to you about this. That's a fact. That's a fact. Well, I, I'll say <laughs> this as well. Based on what um, Arshan said, the biggest problem is playing the music for people for that first time reaction. And most people can't get that. Mm -hmm. Just like you said, right? You have to listen three times. Like I like to listen in my own space. I might not even typically hear like you playing it off your phone or something, or mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just not my environment. Like your I like dirty AirPods. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like no, I ain't gonna put them bitches on, bro. Like get, <laughs> get get them things away from me. You know, you just took them out your ear. So like it, the environment really matters, and giving people space to like comfortably listen to the music the way they actually listen to music, and maybe they need multiple times if it comes to feedback. Then you want that. Now if we're in the studio. Okay, I can see it a little bit more than you just play out of that off of that because there's an environment that's already kind of built around music listening. Yeah. But still it has to be that first time reaction. Like, you know, it's like, all right, and you have to say, Hey, I just kinda wanna know your first vibe, your first thoughts, which is it takes some pressure off of it too, yeah. right? Like, do I feel it or do I you think I'm going somewhere? So yeah, I I I I think it's the artist responsibility when asking people for advice, you know, for their thoughts on their music. And it's their art, it's the artist's responsibility to consider the environment that the people are in and putting them in the best position and give them the best advice. Yeah, I agree. You know with that. I mean? yeah. Like take away the pressure. Say, hey, you can tell like you said, tell me you, you can let me know anything. You know what I mean? I, I I'm strong, you know, I, I'm not gonna be hurt by whatever you say. Yeah. Preface it with stuff like that. Or hey, I'm just looking for your quick, like, you know, nothing deep, but like, do you feel it in general? Or do you like the beat? Do you be yeah. specific? Yeah. So I can give feedback. All those type of types of things help. But at the end of the day, <sighs> most people have a problem telling people they don't like uh they don't like stuff to yeah. their face. Most people are not confrontational. Me, I'm different. <laughs> I see that as a moment to challenge myself. It's like, here's a confrontation. Don't bitch out. This is a moment we where run you run through the fire. Yeah, this is a this is a <laughs> moment where you can practice being strong. That's that's the way I look at it. It's not like, oh, I'm just straight up an asshole. Yeah, I'm gonna tell you, oh, let me hurt these feelings. It's like, nah, I see this as a challenge. Figure it out, Sean. How do I be direct with not being an asshole? Like that that's the way I look at it. But overall the advice, I actually think this is really, really, really good advice. He was specific with it. Yeah. Right? The environment. Um, it's really a, a problem playing the music community <laughs> for, yeah, for, for real, yeah, for real. This is an important conversation that Very needs to be had. Very important conversation <laughs> to be had, man. He needs more views on this uh this TikTok right here. Yeah. So shout out to Arshan, the whole Kids Takeover platform. I didn't know. I think I saw a different clip with him recently. I yeah. didn't know he was still in school. Oh, he was on the. Uh, yeah, he was. On, that was on the Jalil clip where he said that. I didn't know that either, bro. Ah, oh, the Jalil. Yeah. Clip. Well, actually, yeah, yeah. I do know because I follow him on Instagram, and he be some. He be stressing out about school sometimes. He, he don't post about it. Man, you know what I'm saying? I'm like, ah, oh, college student, the life, media content creator struggles, bro. Hey, I get it. Man, he's killing it to be in, in college. I wish I was that clear on what I wanted to do in life back then, right? Or at least had something like that I was dedicated to. Had a um, skill. Or I was trying to figure out what <laughs> hustle. I was probably uh, still trying to sling red boxes at the time. So red boxes? Yeah, the things with like, DVD. I was just about to say, bro, the DVD. What, what do you yeah. mean by sling? Like, what do you mean by that? Start a red box business. Oh, okay. Like, you franchise them things, man. Okay, okay. Was that I, I had all different type of hustles, bro. Just That's crazy, bro. I seen one the other day at a Walgreens, and it blew my mind. I did not know they were still around. Yeah, bro, it shocked me. Like I was like, I had to double back and go look. I was like, is that a fucking red box? <laughs> And what made it even wilder was there was like this old couple like standing in line waiting on it behind this younger couple. Oh, it was a line at the red box. It was like the the younger couple, and then and I, I, maybe not a line, maybe like a, a, a two a, people makes a line as far as I'm concerned. And it was a line. Hey, <laughs> damn, four people 
scrolling through looking for their next release. It blew my mind, bro. That's crazy. Fuck me up. That's crazy. What are they putting it in? <laughs> That's what I'm saying, man. Like I was really like looking at them. I'm, I'm literally sitting in the car looking at them like, nah, man. They just like maybe they just like looking. looking now, maybe they're also surprised that it's over there and they can't believe it. And they're like, oh, I remember baby when we used to have to come and pick up a DVD while getting our eggs. Like, that's what I was thinking. But then I seen one pull a DVD out. And I was like, oh no, he's serious. Like he really taking this home. That's crazy. That's crazy. Like y'all ain't got I don't know, man. Hey, shout out to Red Box. Still yeah, shout getting out to money. Red Box, bro. Still getting money. Maybe I should have, <laughs> you know, stayed on it. <laughs> Had my passive income, you know what I mean? Started selling uh, red box courses and shit. <laughs> Actually, bro, that would have been crazy, especially hey, that time. The way stuff going these days, vending machine business be all on people podcasts. Be the red po- red box magnate. I don't know. I still might look at it, man. We'll, we'll see. We'll see. But oh man, this is not the story I want to do. We have to get into. Let me take a quick second to say if you're an artist trying to blow your music up or if you're a manager, a music professional in general trying to help an artist blow their music up, I have something that's a game changer for you and it's completely free. As you may know, we've helped multiple artists go from zero to hundreds of thousands of streams. We've helped multiple artists go from hundreds of thousands to millions of streams, chart on Billboard, go viral, all of that stuff. And we've now made the way we've branded multiple artists and helped them go viral completely free, step by step in Brandman Network. All you have to do is check out brandmannetwork.com. You apply. It's completely free. But the thing is, We're not going to let everybody in forever. So the faster you apply, the better your chance of getting accepted. Brandmannetwork.com. Check it out. Back to the video. Behind the scenes of one of T.I.'s marketing campaigns. Oh, yeah. A little history. Yeah, a little history. 2007, a big moment in time. And I'm about to show you the meeting, what it looked like. This is the sound of the new Warner. T.I. and T.I.P., they're taking over B.E.T. Executives at Atlantic Records, a Warner label, plan the upcoming release from hip-hop artist T.I. Currently the number one artist, hip-hop artist on MySpace. And you too. Um, big Things Poppin' will be on there this week. They've created special ringtones. He customized a voice tone uh, for, for the troops. It's a broad offering of new products and partnerships, which have sent digital sales from zero to 14% of the company's revenue in four years flat. It's, it's going to be a smash. It'll be awesome. We're no longer just about putting out 10 or 12 songs by an artist every couple of years. Video and ringtones and ringback tones, then connecting them to blogs, to ticketing opportunities when the artist goes on tour, merchandising, uh, you name it. That new revenue can't come quickly enough. Last year, more than half the music acquired in the U.S. was not paid for. The majority of my music. This is the sound of the new Warner. T.I. and T.I.P. They're taking over B.E.T. Everyone was scared of the mighty, the mighty ringtone. (laughs) The mighty, mighty ringtone, man. That is a, a fascinating clip to see. Just the visual, first of all, of seeing... Yeah. Like the the label meeting. Yeah. And you know when you always hear just that stereotype of, man, the people who are in those boardrooms don't look nothing like us or don't look nothing like the culture, da 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 That was the first thing that stood out. I was like, Tia? Yeah. Tia marketing team? Right. But, you know. <laughs> right, right, right. Now, I'm, I'm sure there's people not in this image order that you could catch, you know, that, that they're, they're probably dressed for work. Right. I see a couple of people here that... <laughs> You know what I mean? They might look. They get. They they can have an other side to them. But for the most part, you're like, yo, this ain't. This don't make sense. This ain't our target demographic, right? This ain't. The understanding isn't there, right? But the shit did well, so like they understood something. Yeah, the plan was hard. Like exactly. you, you had the breakdown. There was the. Uh, there was the. The the voicemail thing for the 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 troops. There mm-hmm. was the ringtone stuff. They were like they pumping him hard on MySpace. Which is crazy because I don't remember T.I. being crazy active on MySpace back then, but maybe. Maybe I just right. missed it. Right, that yeah. was weird to me. I, I yeah. didn't know that. Yeah. Maybe it was just for that, that promo window. And then, But yeah, they literally laid out, oh, in the MTV, oh, the music video run, whatever that, that first thing was. But like, there was, we're going to drop the video. We're going to hit them with these ringtones. We're going to gas them on this MySpace shit. 
And then boom, we're gonna we're gonna hit that little side brand niche with this nice little message for the troops. You know what I'm saying? Get a little country love right. going on, you know, yeah. at these times. Yeah. Cause I'm trying to think at that time, no, I think it might have been before the gun stuff. So he might have been in a good, good I was about position. To ask. That's what I was gonna say. The whole T I versus T I P. Was that the was that the one we came out of jail? I can't. No, nah, paper trail was when we paper came trail. out of jail. Paper trail, that's yeah. what it is. That's, that's, that's when we came out of jail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, paper trail is when we came um came out of jail. So a few things that stand up stand out to me is one, saying that online sales went from zero percent market share to fourteen percent in four years. Four years. That number is ridiculous. Yeah. Now you now you see why people were so scared. Yeah. Like, yo, cannibalizing at that rate? Yeah. I don't even know how much money that is. I would have to look at the numbers of how much sales were at that time. And then you add what they say at the end, where they say half or more than half the consumption was not paid for yeah. at the end. Yeah, like this that. is like, you know, prime, like Napster, Napster and all, all that, that stuff. Shit, yeah. So you're easily talking about billions. Yeah. Right? That right there is crazy. And for it to happen that fast is scary as hell. Like, <laughs> if that's my industry, to see somebody coming that fast. Like, I, I know 14% sounds small, but if you can think about, I'm just going to make up some brands. Let's just say it was like McDonald's and Burger King, which you experience in corporate. Let's say McDonald's exists and then Burger King is a new um, burger in town and it's actually killing it. The rate of market growth, you don't see that type of number. Mm-hmm. Even the, the the one that you're afraid of and they're killing it, 14% in, in, in four years is like, it's historical in most in most marketplaces to, to find things growing that fast and cannibalizing you that fast. TikTok would be a good example of that. Yeah. They yeah. they came yeah. so fast. Yeah. Right? When you come that fast, it's just a different monster. So that right there lets me know why it took so long for the music industry to figure it out. And they still don't figure it out, right? But it's like COVID, they say they I don't know. I probably shouldn't have said that. That might get a strike on a video. Damn. <laughs> but like the whole pandemic situation, <laughs> when they say they had a uh, a solution that they were already working on for similar instances. Mm-hmm. All right. This is just me trying to avoid all the words right at this point. <laughs> and so they said that's why they were trying to, they were able to get to a solution so fast. Right. The shots. Now, something like this, and you know, believe that or, or if you're not, I'm not trying to spread no information, y'all. I know a lot of people have strong feelings about that stuff, but this is something that wasn't like, oh, we've been working on a solution like a streaming platform mm-hmm. for years trying to figure something like this out, and then all of a sudden Napster hits, and then we figure it out. Yeah. Right? It's that was just not under works. And then you add all these actors like the music labels having to get on the same page percentages. You have to really rethink the business. So it's it was very hard to literally like say, okay, well, this is the new solution. Yeah, Napster exists. Well, we're just going to create a paid Napster. It's not that simple. Yeah. You would think it would be that simple, but music is so fragmented. The label ownership and the IP is already is 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 has so many stakeholders at play. You can't just you can't do that with music. So it's crazy to to realize that happened so fast. And then on the flip side, you saw Buddy say, oh, man, you know, we no longer are just releasing 10 to 12 songs. Bruh, across a couple of years. I was like, across oh. Across a couple of years. Last in NBA, young boy. Bruh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And now you're going a song a week. You know what I mean? More than songs, uh, one song a week yeah. on average for some people. You're dropping like that, and now you again, once again, understand why these artists are complaining. Yeah, like the old school artists, yeah. right? It's like, mm-hmm. oh, I could drop twelve songs and do millions, and not have to drop another ten to twelve songs for maybe two years. Yeah, see, so like two, three years, bro. Your little break, Bruh. <laughs> like the amount of work is ridiculous from that side. Yeah. So I, I can see. <laughs> I uh, the more I understand, I mean, I always understood like the overall numbers and the history of the industry. But whenever I hear like specifics like this, I'm like, oh, okay, I understand your particular experience, old school artists, and why you feel the way you feel. And honestly, I mean, yes, I know that more artists have an opportunity today, like things are more accessible, da da da. But for the artists that are winning, 
right? Once you get to that level, the winning level, it does sound like the old way was a better way. Yeah, bro. Once like, you're winning, yeah. <laughs> I would rather have the old way if I was a top level artist. Yeah, and it's, it's, what I'm about to say is it, it's going to make a lot more sense, I think, later in the pod when we get to this different topic. Because all this shit connects, and then I kind of think about it like that mm-hmm. point. But I think artists today have they they definitely have a much higher creative output, like a kind of like a um a, a higher mandatory creative output, yes. right? Because it's the the music, more videos. We want more content from you. We want you live streaming and all these. You have to exude all this creative energy all the yep. time. Versus like artists, you know, in these different eras, they had the the creative. You know, of course, they probably I, I would probably argue like a music artist back then. Well, depending on the era in music artists, they probably make about the same amount of music. They probably were still just pumping out songs, you know what I'm saying? Mm. But that was it. You had to do that. You go do your shows, maybe do some TV performances, depending on how big you were. Like your creative output had like good like breaks in between them, except for like maybe when you were on tour. Yep. Versus like today as an artist, buddy, there is no such thing as a real creative break. Even if you take a creative break from the music, you might still have to be creative on TikTok or Instagram mm. or YouTube. Right, or all your uh, outside things you're doing to kind of like maintain attention. So I could kind of see that too, bro. It's like, damn. Like you said, bro, like, yo, 1991, bro, I dropped six songs that year and made $30 million. You want me to drop 60 songs this year and make three TikToks a week? Come on, bro. <laughs> Hell no. For, for 20 bands? Shh. That shit sound good, like I said, to a rising artist. But an established artist? Yeah, I get it too, bro. It's like, hell no. No way, bro. No way. And hey, you already... You know, alluded to it. This next topic right here. Part of the interruption, I have to take this quick commercial break to let you know that we are sponsored by me because I signed myself. We signed ourselves. This is Brand Man Network. That's why we're called No Labels Necessary because no label, nobody else is necessary for us to get the train moving. So if you could just subscribe to show appreciation, we'd really appreciate that. Back to the program. Lear Cohen says short form content is destroying music, particularly the artists, or we want to get into the quote, the music industry is facing one of the biggest crises, <laughs> crises to date. To date. To date. Crazy. Now, do you agree with it? Let's let, let us go through the content before y'all can agree, agree or disagree. Which view do it? Man, let's have this view up and try this one. So, Lior believes that short form video poses a major threat to the music business. He also thinks it might be the music industry savior in one way. But let's go through the three main problems that he presented in this podcast. He says, problem number one is an expectation for modern artists to spend a significant amount of their time, creativity and energy on certain social media platforms that in Cohen's view rarely lead to deeper fandom amongst consumers let's stop right there right because that's what you were talking about right Mm -hmm. tiktok instagram youtube wherever right it's funny he says certain social media platforms i wonder if he avoided specific names not not, not youtube though not right because yeah for y'all who don't know (laughs) leora cohen actually works at youtube Mm -hmm. right but you know, that's important to keep in mind while you're listening to very, very important, important to keep, to keep in mind, mind right yeah. story career def jam all that great stuff but today he's at youtube right so like you said they are having to spend so much creative energy on things beyond the music itself if you are doing that i can imagine that it takes a toll on the music right mm. or you go with the evolutionary argument and say that now they evolved to the point where they can put out high quality music and do all these other things at once. That's an argument that you can make. I sure know that there's not that many artists that really want to lean on that ar- argument, but I think because of the creative output that they are being demanded, the creativity that they're in touch with today well, is at an all time high in terms of a commercial output. Yeah. Right. It's like now I can turn. It's it's like uh, what do you talk? Motown, Motown. I remember Smokey Robinson talking about you know all these artists, you know talking about being inspired. You know, oh, you're if you're a songwriter, you write, right? Like we wrote every day like a job. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad or whatever. But it's a muscle, and you build that muscle, and then you get great at it over time. Next thing you know, you can just write something amazing 
out of nowhere, mm-hmm. right? But it's not going to always be your best or that one, but it's a muscle. We treat this like a job. We built ourselves, so we're built differently. So I can see that from a creative output standpoint, right? If you look at artists today, because they are creating TikToks, creating reels, creating music videos, creating their music, creating teasers, like doing the video editing, a lot of them, all that stuff, their creative output and their ability to churn things out is probably on a different level as a whole. Now, again, though, this is a music business. We're talking music. Is that what's best for the music? Because then you go through the theory of spreading out your energy, Mm. right? It's like, yeah, you're using more creativity and you're more in touch with it from a superficial level, relatively speaking, but you can't go as deep with the music because you can't spend all that time. So there's arguments on on both sides that I get. I feel like I want to go through some more of these points before I personally like try to figure out a hard stance that I want to lean on. But do you already have a hard stance? Well, no, I was like, because there's a part at the bottom too where it goes a little bit more. He like he kind of breaks down a little more into some of the points, where well, the points he's making, and he got some things in that. that but I'm gonna have some, I bet, bet, some, some strong thoughts around. So problem number two, he says lies with consumers themselves and his concern is that the next generation of fans aren't currently delving deep into artists their stories and their catalogs now i think that is the other side of it right you have content creators or artists having to create more put out more stuff Mm. and you putting out more stuff just means i have more stuff to consume from you in the first place let alone everybody's putting out more stuff so how do i keep people's attention the market's so much saturated i'm gonna miss as much stuff and now we already we add that to the era of tiktok or just short form messing up your attention span period Mm. so i don't even have the attention span to go deep if i could go deep or if there wasn't this much saturation out there it's a weird space to be in when you look at that coming from the old school and i'm talking about like old old and not even music like comic books right Mm. my uncle is one of those people who like were into the comics when he was little and he knows all these stories bro just stories and stories and stories and what you'll find with these comic books all right here's an example have you seen black panther yet you still haven't seen it oh all right i haven't huh Damn, I know, huh. bro. See, bro, now you, now you judging me, bro. Like, I'm saying, I didn't even think that was going to come up. <laughs> no. You can't hide from it, man. You can't hide from it. So, there's a character, new character introduced. I'm like, dang, man. That's a crazy character that they, they invented and threw out there. And my uncle was like, nah, man. This dude was in episode uh, series X, Y, and Z from way back when. I'm like, bro, they still have characters. <laughs> To introduce out of all this time, like, how do y'all have so many characters? I'm like, them people at Marvel and uh, DC were going to work yeah. uh, back in the day. And it's like, all of them got these deep stories, yeah. real yeah. backgrounds. Like, they were truly going to work. Y'all are y'all have been introducing new characters for like 20 years damn near now. But back then, my uncle had the attention span to be able to consume all that stuff. He was deep in it and not distracted by a whole lot of different things. I don't know how you develop that today. Like, can you expect people to go that deep into anything today? I think so. I think it's about like how much they care. Right. And like, we go back to the whole, like, I think now the amount of time you have to hold someone's attention to make them care to learn that is a lot longer because Mm -hmm. consumers have a lot more things they could be doing. Right. Right. So it's like, whereas maybe an artist back then, it took fans, let's say, three to six months to care because that's all they had to pay attention to. Now it might take you really like a year, two years to get people to start to kind of care that much. And then, you know, and especially I think it's genre specific too, like with rappers and rap, you got to just keep dropping like hit songs for yeah. the fans on that side. I kind of want to pay attention to you. Versus I do think some of the other genres get a little bit more of like the classic leeway. It was like, you ain't got to be a hit all the time. Just keep dropping shit out like, you know what I'm saying? I, I kind of like stick around. I do think other genres get away with that a little bit more. But yeah, so I, I I do think fans are still doing it. The thing about the argument that I don't think is fair. And like I said, when you get to that bottom part too, because he has a line there that, that kind of made me think about it. But the part I think that isn't fair is that we're not, we haven't had enough time yet to gauge consumer behavior from this generation of artists and, and people. Like, it's unfair to say they don't create long lasting fans 
it's been like two, three years for most of these artists. Like, how do we really gauge that? You know, because with music, you're always, as long as you have the attention around you, you're always just one song away from just reigniting everything. You know what I'm saying? Like, like you could be an artist yeah. that had this big TikTok moment. Maybe you have 60 million monthly listeners at the time. A year later, you got 10 million monthly listeners, right? So you you falling off, but you still have multiple millions of people listening to you, right? Who's to say that four or five years later, you won't have another moment because those people are stuck with you along the way, you know what I'm saying? And kind of have you stand on think about his mindset, though, because two things I'll give to him. He's been in the game a long time, and he's at YouTube, so he probably sees a hell of a lot of data. Yeah, that's true. Right? Yeah. So I'm thinking, yeah, we do know about these people you know, two, three years at this point. But then there's quite a few people, I don't know, if we look at the whole 2010s decade, there's a lot of people who came and went, right? Now, can you say that happens for every generation? I feel like there's probably, you know, there was one hit wonders back Mm -hmm. back then, but maybe it's more at scale. Is that what he's seeing? He's seeing more people. Uh, I think it's about the fringes, actually. Because we know every scenario exists. There's always going to be one-hit wonders. There's always going to be people who stay in the game and become a superstar. It's harder to become a superstar. And then we think about the fact that it's harder to become a superstar today. Then what is that alluding to? It's the fringes of attention. So if you think about 20% being a super fan, 40% not rocking with this at all, now you're leaving another 40% that has the potential to become fans because they're just on the fringes, mm. right? But if you can't get that attention from the fringes, you have a hard time converting in to, to, the, to your fan base. So you're stuck somewhere around 20 to 30% where in the past you had a better opportunity to take that 20% to 50%. You get what I'm saying? Or, yeah. yeah. You know, because even, even convert some of the haters, right? Or 20% to 40%, whatever that number is. So I think that's what it is because if you, when you were come from an era where, even though someone didn't fully rock with you because their attention was they were on the fringes, their intention wasn't on the fringes because they didn't have other places for their attention to go, right? Yeah, it's like when all these people are watching old these old TV shows like today, a show like Friends, right? You have a lot more. You're not going to have as many different races watching a show like Friends as you would back then, right? Or you go to, I'm trying to think of a a black show, like Martin. You're not going to have as many different races watching a show like Martin like you were back then. Why? Because races, genders, all these different interests, we have the things that we're naturally interested in. And something like that might be further from my general interest. I watched Friends when I was younger, not because it was an immediate interest, but it was one of the few things on TV. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And then you watch a story long enough, you can get invested. Yeah. You know what I mean? And yeah. I was like, okay, I'll follow up. What happened to such and such? Okay, and I watch it. I watch it. Oh, it's the only thing on after school or me watching Jerry Springer, all these things that I probably yeah. watched. Right? I used to watch Gilligan's Island a lot when I was little. That's like, crazy. I'm talking about like six years old because I wake up, only thing, it was TBS. It was like 4.30 in the morning, and that was the only thing. It was like Gilligan's Island and some I can't even remember the other show, right? So I'm watching, oh, Andy's, uh, Andy Griffin yeah. show or whatever. Andy, Andy Griffin, I understand. Yeah. yeah like, I get that. I get, <laughs> oh, you that. get that one. Yeah, I get that one. So like these shows <laughs> that in no way I relate to or necessarily, but I, I buy into them because it's all that's on, right? Because that was better than like the news and the 700 Club or whatever it was called and <laughs> the, the the church channel or whatever. So they have my attention. Attention. I'm on the fringes, but because they have that attention, then I, I can get pushed down the funnel. Today, not only are people on the fringes in terms of their first level interest, their attention's also on the fringes. It's one thing to for me to be on the fringes, but you have my attention. It's another thing for me to be on the fringes and you don't quite have my attention. Mm. That goes back to what DDG said, yeah. right? Yeah. Because if you still have my attention, at least you got more of a chance to convince me. And I think that's what the struggle is today when he talks about the consumers on that side. But I don't want to spend too much time on that. 
um because we got a couple problems and this 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 article is so so uh substantial a lot of uh, like dope points yes exactly <laughs> <laughs> that thing thick uh problem number three cohen says lies at the door of record companies who are struggling to break long-term artists with the level of regularity they like in this digital environment all right so you know that naturally alludes to like he's seeing the numbers he know what the record labels are yeah. saying like people aren't lasting and it's probably a trend that they can trace back to you can say oh yeah i pop i'm gone for a while and i come back but shoot that's a comeback story yeah right before it's probably okay i'm around three four years before people even care to see a comeback story not i have one year then i take three years off to come back so yeah that's probably the stuff that they're seeing let's uh where should i start next is it here, Jacory? You wanted to get into? Yeah, yeah. So this is when he starts getting deeper into uh, kind of those, those points. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He's saying, "I don't know the, what the euphoria in the music industry is about. I think we're facing one of our biggest crises to date. Yet it feels like the band is still performing on the Titanic. The Titanic. I don't know if y'all remember that that movie. It was the 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 orchestra performing as a ship sank." Right, he says, I'm confused why there's such euphoria because there are so many people saying, Yo, the music industry is about back, the numbers are looking mm. good. But the reality is, every time I hear that, I do go back and look at the trends. We are not nowhere near where the peak was, yet. Mm. yeah. Right, so it's like we just feel good because we're doing better than before, yeah. But yeah. dang, you fell far, bro. <laughs> yeah, so we jumped from a one to a four, but we still ain't a 10, yeah, exactly. You know we still ain't a 10, exactly. So there are three things that are deeply disturbing to me. The first one is that artists feel like they are completely out of position. They feel like they're about to go on strike. It feels like they're overburdened with the effort like for like likes and uh, subscribers on social media, putting themselves as creators as opposed to artists. I mean, we have been talking about that a whole lot. Yeah, <laughs> we have been the saying that's the game. Streets is rumbling about right. that. The streets is rumbling. I guess we the streets. <laughs> <laughs> we are the streets the more we have artists always being on right like turn the switch off turn the switch on instead of occasionally occasionally brilliant our music industry is going to be in real trouble that occasionally brilliant line isn't actually mine it was actually universal ceo david josephs and just resonated with me okay cool 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 let's get to the next part what is he saying here? I think the answer is short is in short form video. How do we get here? Now, this is when we talk about it being very important, like you said, to remember that he uh, he works for YouTube. He works for YouTube. All right. I think the answer is in short form video. <laughs> short form video that doesn't lead anywhere is the most dangerous thing I've seen the business face in a long time. This is how I imagine him sounding in my head. But short. <laughs> But short form video that can be a discovery tool like YouTube Shorts, aha, aha, it is. can prompt the consumer into a deeper fan engagement of interviews, performances, premium music videos, all the stuff that artists do. do. That allows a kind of, well, you know, that allows a kid to find the soundtrack of their youth. But if they're only stuck on a short form video platform, and if they think that they're getting a music service via short form video, I think the business is going to lose a generation of consumers that are really important and valuable. So what is he basically saying? He's saying, bro, TikTok is not the move. That's what he's saying. That's all I heard right there. Yeah. Is, is that not what he said? And Reels. Basically, Reels doesn't have long form content either. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, so what he's saying is, yo, people being on these short form video platforms and thinking that I'm consuming music. Oh, and when I'm really actually not even consuming the whole song, I'm mm. consuming this artist when really I'm only consider consuming bits and pieces of of the artist versus a completely orchestrated vision is killing the consumer's standard of how to even see the artist. Yeah. Right. That's what he's saying. Where one, I would argue it's probably not to the extent he's seen, because what have we always said? TikTok created the highest transferability from platform to platform that we've ever seen before, specifically for music and to YouTube. Mm -hmm. We would see people go from TikToks and go crazy to people's YouTube because they're probably trying to consume more of the videos. They're trying mm -hmm. to consume the long form, right? Yeah. And we would see crazy results, people going from TikTok to Spotify, yeah. right? 
and Apple, it would you know go back and forth depending on the artist and, and genre, right? So we know that people will go from short form to long form. I think we even read a stat that maybe 50 plus percent of this generation, Gen Z, says that they go from short form to long form. Mm -hmm. So we know that's a behavior. To me, this is just a selling point to say, yeah, but ours is all in one platform. Yeah, That's yeah. all you're saying yeah. right there. You're bigging up your own company and throwing throwing some shade without using the name. That's all this is. And yeah. Can they do it better? It is on one platform. Eh, I say probably. Yeah, well, I mean, there's that convenience aspect, but like you said, bro, he's he's pushing the YouTube shorts agenda because that's it. Shorts culturally isn't the same as TikTok is. Yes, like you know, it's like they're borrowing a lot of elements, but I don't know, just something about the user experience isn't the same. But that becomes my my argument with that argument is how how long does the music industry continue pushing the narrative of the of the stupid consumer? You know what I'm mm. saying? Because like you just said, we've seen it, bro. People on TikTok, like, yeah, there, there, there is this desire for them to go find longer form content from you. That's what short form content tends to do. Yeah. I can become invested in you in 10 seconds, right? The example I would give the, to like our clients and stuff is the same amount of time it takes me to watch one YouTube video, I could have watched like seven TikToks from you, right? Yep. So I, I could fall in love with you a lot faster than if I came through any of your other mediums. I understand that within this realm, I can't consume longer content from you so what am i going to do i'm going to figure out where you're posting long form content and then go over and, yep. and, and, and check it out right that to me seems to be the average behavior of the average consumer like all of us have multiple apps that we use that we yep. understand like hey you are this way over here and you are this way over here so i know when i want this from you i go there when i want this from you i go here right but it always feels like the higher level of the music industry pushes this narrative of like the stupid consumer but like yep. there's this this stupid dumb yeah. consumer that can only look in one lane and one <laughs> vertical and if he's on tiktok he's just gonna forget about youtube and, and xyz right i look i always try <laughs> to tell people the people at the top look at everybody else as stupid yeah they truly do like people <laughs> try to say oh no it's not elitist or the democrats look at people um as more lovingly and the, the republicans are a little bit no no everybody at the top most of them look at people as stupid. Like you gotta look at Hollywood, right? They have a comedian there to then roast the celebrities so they can appear to be more normal. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But if I say I need to put a comedian there to roast me and make it seem like I can take a joke to appear more normal, to me, that means I don't think I'm normal. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, so they're all aware of this and the whole the whole game is to appear to be more relatable, right? That's that's a part of the game, even though you don't think you can truly relate, right? Yeah. Yeah. Because we know that's when you lose people. So that's how they see it. And, you know, to be fair, look, bro, as a marketer, you know, you, you market enough and you be like, damn, people are kind of stupid, right? Or yeah. you say... <laughs> <laughs> or you see it as there's just so many vulnerabilities because you realize even in highly intelligent people, they're vulnerable points because nobody can be on guard at 20 all times when mm. there's an agenda being pushed on them from a hundred different directions at all times. Right. Yeah, yeah. So somebody's going to slip through. Right. And again, that's part of what the, let's say elites are aware of. So the stupid consumer I agree with you. There's a a level of detachment in terms of understanding how the consumer actually thinks. And I actually don't think YouTube Short solved this problem that he's saying. If you're talking about the real problem is long-term artists, I don't think YouTube Short solved that. I think it does have a nice sense of solution in terms of an easier, less friction um, path to go from short form to long form. Yeah. Like you can't deny that. Oh, I'm on the YouTube video and then I can just go to the full video because I've seen there's some shorts now you can actually click a part of the short and go to the long form video, mm -hmm. right? So that right there is beautiful. The problem is that just makes it easier to go the same path that you would on TikTok, right? Go from the short form and go find a long form, mm -hmm. right? But remember, TikTok is now, I helped you identify the sound, 
right? But remember, TikTok didn't used to do that. Remember? Yeah. Somebody would just post it on there and people would start Googling the words of the song yeah. to go find it themselves. So all you're doing is making things more convenient. You're not necessarily changing behavior and outcome, in my opinion, because the problem that's making things hard for the long-term artists to exist is the fact that there's so much saturation. Yeah. Is the fact that the channels are so fragmented, right? Again, like I said, I can't necessarily convince a young black boy to watch a show about 20 something white people as easily as I could before because he might not even be aware of it, mm. right? You can clearly go back to the 90s and, and behind and most people, especially if you're into music at all, you would know who the top country artists are, mm. who the top hip hop artists are, right? This is why Dolly Parton so legendary. Everybody knows Dolly Parton, right? Mm. No matter who, what kind of music you you were into, everybody would know who Whitney Houston is. Yeah. Today, I don't know who the top country artist is. That's not my first genre. So you might be able to go deep on that immediate stuff. It's hard to be aware of anything outside your immediate bubble. So when things are fragmented like that, it's hard to become a legitimate long-term artist and even greater a superstar because part of being a superstar is having all the attention all that attention yeah, all for attention. people you know the grandmas on down and being able to connect with that many people so it, that's just a different type of game i don't think shorts is a solution to that and he's kind of pitching you that but i get it right you know you, you you batting for the home team yeah exactly bro like you gotta you know get them get them shares up you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but it's just it, it, cause the, the thing always draws back to attention span bro and like sometimes yeah. i feel like gen z catches unnecessary smoke about their attention span because you can make the argument that yo these are you know the generation that wants to watch a 10 a, a 10 and 30 second video this is also the same generation that'll watch a six hour live stream on twitch Mm-hmm. Right, it's the same generation that'll sit there and sit through a streamathon. You know, what I'm saying, watch their favorite Twitch streamer stream for twenty four hours straight. But that that person does have to be entertaining. It does have to they do. Gotta have they to, gotta hit the boxes. Yeah, they gotta. Yeah. Hit, so you kind of, yeah. you know, I don't. Know, if, if they that means they have to switch it up a lot, and then there's a participation element um, that goes into it. But that that I, I understand that point. But even that even goes into culture, right? Because mm-hmm. you mentioned culture. I don't think. YouTube shorts will ever have the culture of TikTok. Yeah. Nah. That's when I knew TikTok was good. Like, oh, they got their own culture. Mm-hmm. Right. The only threat to TikTok is American government right now. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that is it. But in terms of the app itself, the culture that's there, it has a completely different utility mm-hmm. than those other platforms. And I feel like, especially generations that don't get it. Older generations or people who just don't use social media, they don't understand all these things look the same to you, but they used, they're used they used differently. Like you said earlier, I, this person might be like this on TikTok, but they act like that on YouTube. They mm-hmm. act like that on Instagram. Everything is a different side of your personality. The communication, the language, it's, it's there are sub-languages, right, on every yeah. single platform. So I think they don't quite get that part of it. And that leads to some of these assumptions to to where you don't understand that impact. You you, you can't overtake the culture of it, TikTok because you can't just you can't duplicate culture. Yeah, exactly. Right? You exactly. can create a new culture, a different culture that also is powerful, but you're not about to you're not about to cut into that culture itself. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Do you have uh anything else to add on that one? Because I know I mean this is I mean, you know, like we said, this is a a thick article right here, but there's so many great points. If you don't have anything on that last one, definitely want to go to this second issue. Well, the one thing I, I will kind of touch on, because it's, it's in that last paragraph, right, where he's like, the kids don't want to do that anymore. Where? Oh, well, right here, right. Here, okay. right. When okay. I was younger, it was okay for me to break open a record, put it on the turntable, and listen. That's how my get down was. Crazy. The kids don't want to do that anymore. They actually want to participate. Short form video. Uh, format allows them to participate, I think that's part of the solution. So one thing I will give him kudos to is he was pushing this narrative a long ass time ago. I don't know if you remember when um, I don't remember exactly what it was but there was a point where YouTube was going to start pulling down user generated videos that were using like songs and stuff. I, I don't remember the, the exact like the conversation around it but it was, this is maybe like three, four years ago. Mm. And Leah Cohen was the one that stood up and was like no, if we kill off UGC videos, we're going to kill off 
the fans been able to participate in, in helping their their favorite mm-hmm. artists grow and things like that. So yeah. it is nice to see that yep. that wasn't a pandering narrative. He, he, he's still sticking to it, or it was a very strong pandering narrative. <sighs> and he's like, nah, this one got to stay in the docket. You know what I'm saying? Like they they fuck with when I, they fuck me when I say this. You know what I'm saying? But <laughs> but because. I mean, we see it, but that's the that's the biggest advantage TikTok has over YouTube is the the ability for the fan to participate is much easier on that than it is on YouTube, bro. Like, you know, mm-hmm. like like YouTube shorts, bro. It's hard to even sometimes figure out how to connect the video to the, the viral sound on there. It's a lot harder to find some of those things. Versus TikTok is streamlined, but you you as a fan could make a TikTok account today and be making videos to your favorite artist song yes. in ten minutes. You know what I'm saying? YouTube, you're gonna be fumbling around a little bit. They make you connect it to your gmail and shit you know what i'm saying all this extra stuff hit those welcome messages but it's like the the process for fans to be a part of the creative process for their artists isn't as streamlined on youtube right. as it is and that's the part that like i'm thinking like unless they have some new feature or update or you user experience coming up that kind of fixes that they're not they're not fucking with tiktok in that part but yeah that was that was the last thing i kind of had on that point it's just it's nice to see him sticking to the same narrative like I, it makes me feel like he really means it you know what i'm saying no that's that's fair. That's fair. And I look, I I'm always ready to see some consistency and see how long somebody's been standing on the on on a hill and if they're willing to die on it. Mm. So that's cool to see. And he was right in that that one, obviously, because the participation is like the culture of today, right? Yeah. Uh, everybody wants to be involved. Well, the younger generation in particular. And I don't even know how much they initially wanted to be involved or they just got indoctrinated into that because it was just fun at first, mm-hmm. right? They were having fun, and now it's an expectation. If I can't be involved, then do I want to be here? Do I want to be here? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Do I want to be here? So this third problem, this it, it continues to get interesting, and I love especially knowing his level of insight into labels. Wait, did we hit the second one? The way he talks. Yeah. Oh well, no, we I actually did skip it. So. Cause you went straight to the bottom. I thought, uh, all right, yeah, yeah. Let's, yeah, let's get that. The second thing that I would like to help solve is the abundance of choice that kids have today. You want to take our choices? Well, let me <laughs> hold up now. Oh, hold up. Let me. They've been hit by a tidal wave of choice. Getting a little dictatory, bro. Uh, the other thing that they're dealing with is that they really cannot stand traditional social media. My life sucks, and everybody else's lives are better. Okay, so this is him quoting like. That's how people feel, apparently. That's how the kids are feeling. Yeah. All right. So then he goes on to say, that's why you're seeing a rejection of traditional social media amongst young people, and you're seeing apps like Be Real explode. When I was younger, it was okay for me to break open a record, put it on the turntable, and listen. That's how my get down was. Okay. Uh, like, that was that part you uh, read. Oh, that was my bad. I thought yeah, that was the bottom yeah. of the oh, So. <sighs> I mean, that's, the, that's the, interesting. the choice thing is interesting, bro. Because see, the 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 thing is that is that I think consumers like having a lot of choice, and the general industry doesn't like the fact that all this choice means that you could not choose me or my thing <laughs> that I want you to choose. Like like you said earlier, but there was a point in in the industry where everything was so controlled and so tight knit that if there were eight artists that you know, I wanted to be mega stars by the end of the year. You know, of course, they're, they're, they had their own Various. roadblocks and things, but yeah. it was more likely to be able to control the process. I can put you in these spaces that everybody is, is paying attention to because they have nothing else to pay attention to. Right. Versus, like, and you already said, like, I won't super um, get into it because you, you really touched on it earlier, but it's like today we have so many different things that could be paying attention to. You could be an artist that's huge in this community over here. Right, like how many times have you come across an artist? You're like, oh, who's this guy? You look at it and he got like 20 million monthly lists. You're like, who do you like? Who the fuck is this? How? You know what I'm saying? Like, how exactly, how? bro? And you look at it and they're just popping in a whole different space. Yep. And I think that segmentation, the growing segmentation of that, because we're, we're going to see a lot more of that. We said on another episode, right? Like the the upper class of artists is going to shrink, but the middle class is going to extend. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Going to mm-hmm. grow like crazy. So you're going to keep seeing that. And I think that segmentation. I ain't gonna say I think that segmentation is scary for the major label entity because it's like so much of that structure Facts. revolved around being able to control the process from artist to fan discovery. Now we have no control over it. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like we we don't we somebody's popping right now, getting ready to get their 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 first viral song. We don't know who the fuck it is. You know what I'm saying? Like we don't know who and that person is. That's because control brings you a level of comfort. Yeah, right. It's safe. 
right? It's safe. And all of these companies are risk averse. The bigger you get, the more you just want to hold on to what you got, the way things are moving. But less control can actually be better in many cases. Mm-hmm. And I'm talking about even for the individual. Case in point, John D. Rockefeller, Standard Oil, billionaire, like going crazy. The, the money is, is, is great. Now, I, I think he was, I think he was even a billionaire before the without inflation because you know some of those old billionaires still they'll say in that time it, it, richest man in the world let's put it that way so he had standard oil it was a monopoly vertically integrated beautiful and then because he was a monopoly they were like yo we got to break this bad boy up this is where you get exxon and all these other oil companies right when they broke the companies up he became richer so he lost control Mm-hmm. but he got more money yeah all right so sometimes that's not the most profitable route to just have it all that control but you're willing to lose some of those gains just for the certainty to know that i got my hand on the foot yeah. <laughs> you get what i'm saying yeah. so you know that right there is was what the industry is dealing with and then when you bring it back though to your statement i actually disagree with people wanting more choices i think it's a little bit more nuanced than that. I think what I see is philo- philosophically people want more choices. In true behavior, people don't. Oh yeah. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. All right, that's the idea of decision fatigue. It's been research, right? Oh yeah, you come up to me, I got a little food stand or a food truck. I got three ice cream flavors. Oftentimes I'm going to get more sales than if I had 50 ice cream flavors. Why? Because people get tired of trying to figure out what do I want. I've been to look at the menu at restaurants before. You're like, dang. Like, ah. I got six flavors of ice cream? Yeah, how y'all got six flavors of ice cream, 20 flavors of wings. I don't know <laughs> what to choose. Just give me the basics. I'm like, I'm not going to even look anymore. Just give me some lemon pepper, you know, hot, yeah. like just the basics, right? So there is that a such thing as having too much choice. You know, we also experience it like changing channels on the TV. Like just mm-hmm. it's what what are the best options? And then how can I choose from the best options? That's why curation is always gonna be so powerful. Yeah. Right? Cause now I can trust you that you've already sifted out, right? Some of the best options. I was just talking to Jason Grishkoff, the founder of Submit Hub, and he was like, <sighs> The ethics of a curator, he's big on that. The ethics of a curator, all right? And he's not being, he's not for payola because the ethics of a curator is you're showing me this because it's your opinion. This is your taste, all right? My argument was, well, the best curators, you can pay them, but they're not going to take the money unless they still yeah. stand by the actual product, right? Why are they going to take the money and still say what they got to say? No. You know, right? <laughs> right? I mean, you know. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You saying say what they got to say? Like, hey, I'm gonna put this music up here, but I'm also gonna say yeah, it's I'm trash. Be, I'm or, be truthful or about it. Yeah. I'm be truthful about it, right? Yeah. So to me, there's yeah. that fine line. But the point is, people rely on curators to make decisions for them. That's all it is. You know what I mean? Like, it's just like asking somebody else for their opinion because you don't feel like thinking. Yeah. And I'm like, oh yeah, well, what did you see? What what is Biden? Um, you know, what what is his uh his policies that he's standing on this time? Oh, what is Trump? talking about this time and mm-hmm. what's Warnock talking about what's Herschel Walker talking about you just you, you get some shorthand because you don't have time to look through everything about everything so curators are ex- I mean I think they're going to become increasingly more powerful than we think you know there it's not gatekeeping because of the traditional sense but curators are definitely going to become more and more useful because of this choice making and I think people, it's up to people to find their own curators in life. I don't know how the hell you take away people's choices. Like he's saying he wants to get rid of their choices, basically, or he just thinks people have too much. Let me re- re- read that before I, yeah, let me see. We want to, how can we, yeah, he would like to help solve the abundance of choice. How do you solve somebody having too many choices? That's what I'm saying. Like, you, you can't unless you either take get, them away. Yeah, you take them away, bro. Get rid of the competition or you create some type of barrier. And for that. people to have that they have to pass through to, to qualify for, right? Which is 
basically going back to old music industry system. It's like this Sounds ideal like of an old system in a new world. You know what I'm saying? Type yep. of thing. Like like a, 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 I guess more perfect probably. But like that's the thing. Like, but he he literally answered why I don't think that's going to work. And the earlier paragraph is yeah. fans are too are too invested in their choice in, in artists that becomes successful. Because that that is the thing I do think fans have this power through the social media app of being of having it truly feel like, oh, I picked this person to be successful, right? You are especially the earlier you kind of catch them. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like you I saw you as a small creator. You have five hundred followers on TikTok. I like that one snippet you had. Yo, it's been me following you and liking you and sending you those donations, right? And and doing XYZ to kind of like get you to this point. And I think social media is at least you know, because really the algorithms curating what you see. So if we want to be super technical, the algorithms of the platforms are the curators. That's what I'm you know saying? saying. Like it's the illusion of yeah, choice. Exactly. They're but they, investing yeah. in the illusion, <laughs> right? Because we know what what do we have to do as marketers? We talked about on last yeah. episode. We have to lie to you because you want us to lie to you, so you can feel like you made the decision, even though I'm only here or you're only seeing mm-hmm. this because I pre I, I made that here. decision for you. Yeah. I put it there. I was like right? I knew you was gonna like this shit. That's, what, that's like why it's right here. Yeah. <laughs> You know what I mean? That's why you were keyword in Facebook. Facebook knew you was gonna like this, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's 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 that struggle again. People people philosophically want all the choices in the world, but I think as humans we're limited, and we actually can't handle all the choices in the world. Yeah, but that's right? the fun, that's the fine line though. I don't think he's gonna figure out like how do you keep the illusion of choice while taking away choice. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like. Hey, here go 15 people that you can pick from, but really I picked out 15, right? Like the the label doesn't have enough, I think, of a a stable like AR infrastructure to have that kind of control. Mm. Because the internet is still gonna be the internet. The people still gonna will still pick who they want. And one way or another, but they will figure it out, bro. Like it goes back to the, the old days. If it was a motherfucker on the street that was hot and the town was hearing about it, but they would, they would get them lit, right? The word would spread. So it's yeah. like one way or another, bro, pe- people are going to be the ones that kind of like pick pick these people. It just happens a lot faster on the internet, you know what I'm saying? Because yeah. of how fast shit can spread. So it's like, how do you truly take away someone's choice while leaving the illusion of choice? I don't think they can, they can completely exist in today's music landscape because you have no way to predict like who, who you need to put into your system of control until they're already popping, you know what I'm saying? At that point. Right. And they were picked by the people. The very people you were trying to take choice away. That's cho- true. Choice away from, you know? That's true. I think, yeah, if we think about what's happening today, right? People, companies, A&Rs, managers, people allow the system of people, right, to make the decisions first. Mm. And then, the, oh, here it is. They're allowing the general public to curate. To be curators for them. Yeah. Because it's too many damn artists out here. Because yeah. too many artists now can't create music, right? Yeah. So they're yeah. allowing the general public to curate from them versus them doing all of the curation and curating and influencing the public. So I think, if anything, there's just a cycle today. Yeah. Right? General public influences us. We influence the general public. General public, public influences us. We influence the general public. I think that's just as good as it's going to get. And finding ways to allow that to be expedited or be more accurate in the way you analyze the general public's in- sentiment is the solution on the labor or industry side. And maybe once artists at a certain level, you can create that illusion of choice. Mm. But that part I'm, I'm struggling to see like how you, yeah, how you actually pull that off. Yeah, bro. I don't, I don't, I don't think they will. It's not going to be YouTube, bro. It's not going to be, <laughs> it's not going to be YouTube. As much yeah. as I love YouTube, bro, it's not going to be them. Yeah. Hmm. I think if anything, if anybody was could do it, it's TikTok. Because you don't know why the hell you're seeing what you're seeing. Yeah. All right. So there's that. I feel like anything they're showing me is that I'm just seeing just because. And we've we've bought into that reason. Even though we know it's a black box, for some reason we like we feel like it's random, but we know it's not random at the same time. And because I decided to watch this video and didn't decide that watch that video, it in fact is a choice of mine. That's how we see it. So TikTok in some way is doing it probably beyond everybody else. And then maybe the metaverse there'll be some ways that they could pull that off. But but okay. Okay. So that's that's something to think about, something to chew on. Maybe we come back with that one. But 
let's get into this third problem because again I, I think it's so interesting because we know his experience with the record labels and how closely he speaks with these folks and he said i've never seen so much confusion at record labels they actually don't know how to break artists anymore all right artists y'all hear that they don't know how to break artists we kind of said some of this stuff anyway all right record companies used to be able to work to a date in an artist campaign and focus on that date. Dang, you saying that came in focus? It's not as clean anymore. There's an elongation of the process of breaking an artist. The runway is littered with artists in the process of breaking. I'm like, what does that mean? Uh, a lot of metaphorically uh, deleted artist bodies on the path to the successful artist. Oh, dang. Yeah. No. yeah. Very mm. vivid imagery. I just okay. picture like, I'm yeah. saying deleted, you know what I'm saying? Like a deleted music artist is laid across the sidewalk, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> While the new superstar walks up the, the pearly gates. <laughs> Finally <laughs> made the, it. Into the shining abyss of success. Uh, right, right. You, you you dashing down, you know, the track. You see all these bodies laying down, and you're like, whew, good thing I didn't fall out. And then, bam, you, you get taken out, too, before you made it to that finish line. Yeah, bro. It's like, what, what was that stat? Like, like labels would sound like a, a thousand artists every – I don't remember the time frame. I remember yeah. being something crazy, bro. So I was like, yeah, bro, maybe 10 of them are successful every year, but I mean, there's thousands of metaphorically deleted artist bodies. You know what I'm saying? They paved Got the it. way for those 10 to be successful in right. some way. You know. Right. And, this is, and it's important in this conversation to keep in mind that cre going viral is not breaking mm -hmm. as an artist. Breaking a song is not breaking an artist. Yeah. Right? So- all these things are in consideration. So what he's saying and getting to that point of breaking an artist, and his point of breaking an artist is probably different than what we um, consider breaking an artist. He probably has a higher standard than, than we do, just to be real, based off of yeah. you know what he's seeing. And that's probably not the thing that he's considering as well, though. Remember, being detached from the general public, so many artists are happy with what they consider to be their breaking point, but he would be unhappy with that mm -hmm. point because yeah. he doesn't consider it meaningful until they get to a certain point. Yeah. As a label, as somebody who profits and you need to see a certain amount of money, just like a lot of people will be happy to have a company doing 50 million a year and you'll have some people like, yo, like we got to get rid of this line of business. That's yeah, it's over. <laughs> it's over. <laughs> we gotta, <laughs> it don't matter if it's not hitting the bill or, or 500 mil, whatever. So, that's that some of that is to be considered by the way now the process all right so it's not as clean anymore there's an elongation of the process of breaking an artist the runway is littered with artists in the process of breaking getting kids to participate in short form video as their 3.0 version of social media will help labels act you know will help labels break acts and take social media burden away from artists all right, now you're just talking about TikTok again, bro. You you, you low-key diss TikTok, but now you're actually saying the thing that TikTok brought to the game and scaled far beyond anyone else is the solution. Mm -hmm. So the solution is actually happening already. The solution is the problem. The solution is the problem. <laughs> the problem is the solution. So I, 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 I'm now very interested to see where he goes. I know we're going to the sales pitch. Yeah, but we have to prompt <laughs> the consumer of the grazing mode and into fan engagement mode. No, we have to prompt the consumer out of the grazing mode and into the fan engagement mode. Okay, that is the key, and that's my mission with shorts. <laughs> ah, to you, I got a sales pitch. To use it as a discovery tool. <laughs> and prompt consumers into a multi-format richer experience instead of the empty calories that are on other short form video short form video platforms i like to think of shorts like an appetizer youtube like the main course and subscription via youtube music like the audio dessert i see you with the analogy you, you've been hanging around rappers for too long <laughs> that is i think a much better health a much healthier ecosystem He's killing this analogy with the healthy and the food, the appetizers. I'm loving it. The empty calories, bro. For the music business, it's sustainable and actually allows artists to go back to their craft. And it also helps labels break artists and helps consumers find the soundtrack of their youth and become deeper and more committed fans. <sighs> uh, all right. So, like, simplifying it, he's saying YouTube shorts to the YouTube page, right? where you watch 
a music video, longer form of content. You could be vlogging. You go yeah. into that full world. Yeah. And then you have the ability to do subscriptions on that platform. Yeah. I can also funnel over to the music. You can now find it over to the music, right? So you have your Patreon on YouTube. I would be interested to see, because I'm, I'm not super familiar with the YouTube subscription program. Um, and you know how you have people subscribe to you. Because I'm, I'm not thinking about like the subscribing to YouTube music, but like when you subscribe to your channel, right? Yeah. Do they have a gated process yet? Like where some stuff only shows. I know when you're doing like a super chat, it shows benefit that, oh, this person, you know, is a part of my subscriber program and things like that. And you can say only subscribers can comment. But is there gated content on YouTube? I don't know, actually. I don't know. I never looked into that. Yeah. I, I would think so because I know at one point they were going hard. We're kind of like competing with like Patreon and stuff like that. Right. So I'll, maybe actually we should look into that. Yeah, we should. We should. I, I I feel like it's not there yet, but I could see it organically being there, right? Yeah. Because then, I mean, man, we talked about the issues of with Patreon that that other day. I mean, man, YouTube pretty much has everything there. Just like now, they have uh, shorts segmented on yeah. your main page. Yeah. Imagine, and they have your community comments segmented on that main page. Imagine you just have another segment that subscribers only. All right, you might have one video there for non subscribers. They only see that one video and it's just talking about the inside of it. But you open that up and literally it's just more YouTube videos and the comments. That's the same experience, mm, like, yeah. except I can only see this if I'm there. So they do, if they did that, they're already better than Patreon in my, my, uh, mind. All right. Yeah. yeah. So they could do some damage in that space. Now, actually selling people and converting people onto that platform, that's always a whole nother story, though. All right, and these programs, no matter how good and innovative you are, it could truly be a better product, but it won't matter if you can't get people to adopt it enough to continue to invest in it. So we'll we'll see. But if YouTube's really invested in that, I would like to see it. I think it could be better than anything we have today or at least more streamlined. Is it the answer to the solution? I mean, to the problem that he keeps presenting? No. Uh, uh. I think it's just their way to better monetize on the new ecosystem that exists. Yeah. I don't necessarily see it as a problem solver. Yeah. Cause I mean, it's really, it's really just a different experience of the, the bigger experience that everybody wants to do. It's like everybody has a short form content, you know, aspect of their platform now, other yep. than maybe Twitter. Well, I guess Twitter is all short form really. Yep. Uh, so their big selling point is like, hey, we can become the place where your short form content pushes the long form and then that long form pushes the music. Like the platform where that whole process can be streamlined from you. You don't have the break like you do from TikTok to whatever, you know, or Instagram or whatever, um, which is fair. That's a great point. It's a fair point, right? It, it is. YouTube is probably, is, I wouldn't say probably, is the most music industry friendly platform I think there is. 100%. You know, like it's it's not like the users don't aren't friendly towards it, but like they're as a platform, they're always thinking about the music industry, right? Mm -hmm. and, and kind of like their impact on that side. So I think the model is like great in theory, but it ignores realistic user behavior because it's very rare that you have someone that likes to use almost like the entire ecosystem of of a of a thing, right? Like for example, like I I'm deep into Google sweet you know what i'm saying like i love google sweet but i got a couple apps that i'm not i'm not checking out no matter how much i, I love google right or like mm. like apple like i'm deep in the apple world there's some products i'm never getting like i like apple but i don't like them that much you know what i'm saying there's gonna be elements of this that people feel the same about hey man bro you just you just spoke to me right <laughs> you just spoke to me i just had this experience dog <laughs> my my uncle i went over thanksgiving when i went to his house he has a samsung smart refrigerator Oh shit! This junk is it's amazing. Yeah, I was gonna say that shit's beautiful. Yeah, it was beautiful, <laughs> bro. And you know, he was everything was so streamlined because he's all Samsung or whatever. Mm -hmm. da, da, da. And I'm like, dang, is that worth considering going back to my Samsung? Because I'm only like two years into Apple, probably. Oh yeah. You know what I mean? I'm like, dang, and is that worth going back? I've had a Mac for maybe four, and the iPhone for for two. But I'm like, nah, because my work experience is too too perfect. I need Apple for my work experience. Mm -hmm. The phone and 
and laptop being synced. That was it. Matter of fact, remember that was when you told me you were, you were recording videos and then you were airdropping shit yeah. to you. I was like, oh my gosh, I need that. That, that <laughs> that's a game changer. So that my 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 work experience is one thing, but dang, I'm like, I would probably like my house. I don't want an Apple for refrigerator. Uh, Apple or something. fridge, bro. That just sounds crazy. <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't want an Apple TV personally. Crazy. You know what I mean? So crazy. At some point, you. you the interest does, like uh, it does segment off. You're not you're not going to be fully invested in everything, controlling every. There's just going to be those few, you know, obsessive people about a brand. But yeah, there's some YouTube music there. users out there, whoever y'all are. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> like they exist. <laughs> the oh, the numbers keep growing every year. So, <laughs> but it's just like, I, it, like I said, the the funnel itself, I think, is perfect. They just are not. The only part of the funnel that YouTube is the strongest in is the long form aspect of it. Because yeah. like you said, the culture of TikTok is a large part of the reason why TikTok dominates there. It's not because people are making better seven second videos over there. Or maybe they are, right? Because, but it's like the culture of it breeds ideas at a quicker rate. Like collaboration mm-hmm. aspect of it is a yeah. lot faster on there, right? Like like we talked about earlier, like the the fan interaction and engagement can happen a lot faster on a TikTok than it can on a, on a YouTube mm-hmm. short. Like even TikTok itself, has made it easier for people to do that. Like they give you editing tools, right? And that like and some yes. some good editing tools, bro. It's not like Very. some bullshit little clip, you know what I'm saying? Like a scissor tool, or whatever it's called, bro. It's like, no, you could it, it's damn near Adobe Premiere Lite in that yes. shit. You know what I'm saying? People create better short form content because of TikTok. But exactly. Exactly. Like, it exactly. forced that and created that environment. YouTube shorts is only going to be re- reaping TikToks rewards mm-hmm. in that regard it's like, yeah. okay yeah you not even just talking about oh secondary content it's like no when it comes to short form tiktok is the school yeah you know what i mean so it's it's so it's like that it's like you're you're trying to win the battle with a platform that i don't think you're going to win with and like we said it right now bro the, the social media war to pay attention to is tiktok versus youtube yep it's not tiktok versus instagram like some people might think but it is tiktok versus YouTube. they're literally Easy. doing things to take shots at each other Right, TikTok has the live stream thing, which I strongly believe is their way of trying to train their users to be more okay with long form content, so they can compete with TikTok. I mean, would compete with YouTube. Right. right, YouTube is trying to put more emphasis on shorts, so they can get the the short form content aspect of it to be able to compete with TikTok. It's crazy, bro. They're literally taking each other's things and trying to optimize it better. Um, and then even the music industry. I think Leo takes a shot at TikTok and he's like, "Yo, they've been trying to make their little music industry." No distribution shit happened for the longest. How's that going, right? So he acknowledges that they're coming for a, yes. a, a similar business model, that a, a similar artist to, to industry pipeline that YouTube mm-hmm. is trying to create. And like, and TikTok might be the only serious competitor that they have in that in that regard. So that's why I said like that sales pitch sounds nice. Yep. You know what I'm saying? It sounds good to the higher up person that I don't think is looking at the traditional music fan. And you brought up a good point too that I didn't think about, like. He could just be looking at it from a different lens. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. he said, like what he might consider to be successful artists. So the, he he might be thinking of, you know what I'm saying? He might be thinking of Olivia Rodrigo in his head while we thinking about like I can't even think about it. You know what I'm saying? Like like DDG or something, right? It's yeah. like yeah, the, 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 we're looking at the issue from two different vantage points. I could I could I could acknowledge that. Yeah. But I think if we talk about like just general consumer uh, consumer behavior. I don't know. He's fighting. I think he's fighting a losing war, bro. It's like the people have shown like this is the direction they want things to go in, yep. and I don't think you you don't win the battle trying to fight user behavior. You win it trying to figure out how you can adapt to it, which is what he's doing. Like we, I give him credit for that. Yeah. But the this article is just confusing because like, but you come in the shit on it to then say <laughs> it's the answer, and it's the answer because we're doing it this way, All right? But everybody else is doing that shit. That shit don't make no sense. Oh, yeah, our short form content gonna make people wanna watch long videos, but yours for whatever reason won't. Bro, that's what today has come to, bro. <laughs> we we today is an age where even Leor Cohen has to troll and be polarizing. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, oh, he's always been like that, actually. Now I think about it. Yeah. He's always been straightforward. Yeah. You know what I mean? But that felt like the order of everything. It's probably how the article is positioned, so I'm not going to even say it all to Leo Cora Cohen, but just like you said, yeah, he shit on it to then say we got better shit. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah. And that that's cool. I think that the, the last thing that I, I get from this whole thing is 
It's very clear. YouTube has a strong chance of having their own distribution platform at some point. Shit. Yeah. Just because that's what it looks like to have to compete with TikTok. Yeah. And what's even clearer, and that's more speculation or or guessing. I I'll, I'll, I'll say that. I'll say what's more clear is YouTube having YouTube, TikTok, tech companies, social media platforms in general. That's the new influence when it comes to record labels and the hot job. Just look at how people move who want jobs. Mm. What's the hot company to be at? If I'm in music, oh, I want to be at YouTube. Oh, I want to be at TikTok. That's really it, actually. Like, it's not that you don't want to be anywhere else, but like the hottest ones and, and that look like they're leading and they're cutting edge and know where things are going. And Spotify still has some of that too, mm-hmm. but it's not the labels like it used to be. Yeah. Right? Not the labels. It's the tech companies for music executives. That's a whole different landscape that we're in. And it just shows the control of it. And we know that it's not going to stop. So there's people who are still at labels. I'm sure they have great jobs and, and they love their job. They're making money. And it's not, and it's not like they, what they're doing is completely irrelevant. But day to day, what they're doing is highly influenced by what's happening at the tech companies. Mm-hmm. And if you're at a tech company, you're a part of the leading charge and the main influence versus having to react as much yeah. to the record label. You know, record label is like government. That's what it is, right? We regulate. <laughs> whoa, whoa. We figure out how we can regulate so we can make it commercial, make it good for everybody and the actors involved. Tech is, I mean, they tech. They, they're they the innovators. They're yeah. the pioneer of how this thing is actually going. It's what's being followed. So, I mean, that's only going to continue. And it seems like tech is solving a lot of their issues, right, with the label side of things by figuring out how can we get rid of these guys? Cause tech don't like to have to answer on anybody. Mm. <laughs> That's why, you know, TikTok with sound on and, and having their own systems. Yeah. So yeah, that'll be interesting to watch. Uh, shoot, just over the next two years alone, let alone the next five, but we'll continue to revisit that. Uh, shout out to Leo Cohen for dropping a, a, a well-versed article with a lot of points that we can, we we can speak on. Yeah, I ain't gonna, I ain't gonna lie, man. Enjoy that. I'm kind of scared for when uh, Dame Dash see this clip. What you mean? Oh, I don't, I don't know, man. I just I don't feel like good things could come from it. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Oh yeah. We need to put it in Dame face. Dude. Put it in Dame face. Oh, yeah, hopefully he see it, man. Yeah. Hopefully you see this Dame and you just appreciate the knowledge aspect of it. You know? <laughs> Those are two smart gentlemen. Hey, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Uh, all right, so I think I'm gonna skip that just just for time's sake. One thing that I want to talk about. No, we'll 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 end it here. To make this the last topic. Okay, right here. All right, which is nothing to pull up. But do you remember last time when I talked about the Vlad TV model, and I said we well, yeah. need to talk about it next time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so when we talked about Vlad TV and the whole Sweetie situation. Which I do want to say, by the way, I listened to that EP today, and it's not that bad. We already know it don't have to be bad to not get listened to. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I actually saw, it was actually a clip on a Joe Budden podcast or whatever. No, the Rory and Maul podcast, and he was reading through the lyrics, and by the end of it, he was like, man, she she going hard on this song. Let me yeah, go actually yeah. listen to the rock. So, it could be good. I haven't gotten there yet, but I, I, I'm going to get there. But yeah, music does not have to be bad <laughs> to not be listened to, right? <laughs> it's my own prerogative and the and same for the rest of the public. Now, with that being said, though, you know, the whole thing was Vlad talked about somebody on Sweetie's team turning down the Vlad interview. Mm-hmm. And Sweetie actually later tweeted that it wasn't her, right? Because Vlad initially thought it was Sweetie. And in that whole conversation you mentioned that vlad offered sweetie ten thousand dollars right to do the interview all right that was the number Mm -hmm. all right so i'm gonna pull up vlad tv real quick on the youtube you know what i'm saying let let me pull this up oh yeah youtube app you said wait what it's a youtube app right at the top oh look at that artist right shout out to you uh reeking the menace (laughs) <laughs> I'm reeking. Puerto Rican, I get it. 
Um, so we go to Vlad TV's page. Let's look at Boosie interviews. Uh, so, and actually, this is so perfect. It's so perfect. So you go to Vlad TV's page, man. And what do we know about YouTube? When you got your ass turned on, you get paid money. You make do money. You not? Yeah. Do you not? So if he's giving her 10K, he probably gets that money just off of the interview. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Right? Definitely. Yeah, definitely. And then if you look at how he snips stuff up, more, more money. That's why he does coming. them snippets like that, man. Yeah. So if you look at, let me see, sweet 10K, 10K, probably a million views. Yeah. A million views, ten thousand dollars. Sweetie interviews, you ask some sensational questions and everything, you throw that in there. He probably has one, two, three, probably th- within three snippets. He'll probably get that 10K back yeah. at least, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then at the end of the day, we know Vlad will have like 20 snippets, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Yeah. And make another 30 to 40K, something like that, right? Yeah. I just now get his business models in a, on a whole other level. I know he probably, he, you know, he has ads, he has his own website, but, but man, once you said that number as far as him being able to pay artists, because shoot, man, I wouldn't be surprised, like, if he was doing so many interviews with Boosie, because Boosie probably like, hell yeah, bro, you know, you're going to give me 10K every time I do this, or 20, 5K, whatever the number is, Yeah, whatever right? he feels like that works. Yeah, yeah, like, oh yeah, I'll just take quick little number because Vlad know he's going to get crazy views. People going to watch it more more likely to watch other Vlad videos once you watch them. Mm-hmm. Right? And so there's like, I might have, and some of these people he's not even paying because Vlad's platform is also worth it for a lot of people. It's like, yo, I'm not even on this level. Vlad's going to give me visibility. So you got the people that you don't pay. Then you got the people that you do pay. Right? And the people that you do pay just off the interview alone, you're going to make that money back. And you get somebody like Boosie who is basically a star when it comes to commentary. Everybody's going to watch. I mean, you're hitting gold. He's doing the same thing with Sean Perez and Young Jock, those interviews. Mm-hmm. Like, they hit, next thing you know, Sean Perez on an interview, Young Jock, probably like four times in the last two months or something. All right? Like, because the clips is going crazy. And yeah. Bruce, uh, Jock is one of those same types of guys. So, all I have to say, when you put that number out there, it just clicked. It made everything make so much sense. And just... Just such a beautiful business model, and I know that's yeah. probably a this is a small portion of whatever Vlad's full business model, et cetera, is. But like the fact that I can, because of my YouTube page is so big, he again he probably can get plenty of these people who are going to do very well off of the fact that one is a big platform and you're exposing people. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I'm doing this because it's an op. If I don't need the op. Still, it's a respectable platform. I'm getting a lot of views. It's getting my message out. It's a great look, yeah. right? Because they're yeah. still like art, big artists go to a radio station. They're still they're not expecting the radio station to pay pay them, yeah. right? Yeah. So you still get that. But then in the situation that I do need to pay people, I'm making the money back. I'm making the money back easy just off of the the views on YouTube. Yeah, I mean he's essentially just buying content. Yes. Right. Because another Buying content and having full ownership of the shit. Yeah. Because I was gonna say like another thing I noticed that a lot of them are starting to do is they'll take old interviews and then be like, here, throwback interview of the day, bro, right? He throwback. He kills, he kills that, bro. Like, yeah. He kills that. And so it's like, man, I literally have this content to use in perpetuity. You know what I'm saying? Yep. Um, the bigger you get, the bigger this clip gets. Mm-hmm. And so you bring more people back to my other content, bro. That's a beautiful model, bro. Beautiful. Beautiful man. model and. I mean, I assume that's what all of their business models are, but him, no jumper, I would assume it's a part of the Breakfast Club model at some point. Right. Not a Breakfast Club, I don't think they can oh, do that. Oh, because the radio, yeah, yeah you're the right. the radio yeah. situation yeah. is just a different climate. They can't do that. Well, maybe our heart. Our heart's definitely looking at it that way. Yeah, sure. Yeah, our heart's looking <laughs> at it like that. Maybe not them, but yeah, yeah. our heart is. But, because it's like, and that what is what used to be so interesting about um, Adam 22 with no jumpers version of it. Because to me, his is a little bit more risky because he he interviews a lot of like smaller artists, right? Like newer people into the music scene. But he's probably definitely not paying those people. You know no, what I'm saying? Not at all. No, I, I doubt yeah, it. exactly, bro. And it's like, but it was like when he did that that first like XSX Tentacion interview. Like that video, that interview was everywhere, bro. That shit was viral as fuck. And I think I wonder how much money he's made off that video. That was probably free as fuck. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, like yeah. probably made a lot of money off of it. And then just yeah. having the, the the ability to clip it up and. 
introducing during different conversations uh, as the artist grows and builds. It's like that one ten thousand dollar interview that I paid you for. If you are successful and you keep moving and having a successful career, that could easily be a couple hundred thousand. You know what I'm saying? Dollars mm-hmm. for me. Off of just like content revenue, not even let alone like you said, like the people that just convert to the other shit, like his website, and, and I'm sure he's selling merch and all these other back end things, right? Crazy, bro. It's a beautiful business model, bro. It's <laughs> it's so smooth. It works so cleanly. Yeah, the slang and content, bro, and the, and the fact that you know he keeps it really simple too. That's the beautiful part about it too, mm-hmm. right? It's to sit down. It's just on them. The production don't have to be stupid, yep. crazy, it's cheap, cheap, man. Hey man, we might have to start. Yeah, but we gotta start getting guests, bro. For that exact reason. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? Hey, you, you know, y'all, y'all come on in. Y'all come on on. Or, or look, I start one of those channels, um, like a side channel, and then just have like a little cousin or somebody do all the interviews. Yeah. Just be automated. <laughs> we just book all the interviews for them. <laughs> bro, that'd be crazy, bro. That'd be crazy. Bro, are you, are you familiar? With the YouTube automation channel thing, hmm. man, it made stuff finally make sense to me. I was surprised that I wasn't aware of this is what was going on. But you ever been to one of those YouTube pages and it has like the weird robotic voice yeah. in the article? Yeah. And you're like, this is weird as shit. Like, why are people doing this? People are weird for like <laughs> taking their time and doing this, right? And now I understand the human behavior behind it. So people are trying to make money from ads by having these automated voices read Mm -hmm. right so so obviously if i have an ad if i have an automated voice read through a script right now i can literally not have to do anything personally and then make all the ad dollars all right so i'm never running the channel it's never about my face it's a faceless youtube channel matter of fact here's here's the system broken down in full So I go and find a hot topic, all right, or a hot niche first, right? So like, let's say it's hip hop and we know there's always news about culture and hip hop, period. Yeah, yeah. So since I have that, then I'm just going to take an article and literally insert that article into the softwares that'll literally paraphrase the article so the words change up a little bit. And then I have a voice over read that and the voice over the robot so it's like everything yeah, it's automated automated yeah. and the channel's growing now yeah. what they've ha- seen happen apparently is youtube's cracked down on a lot of those channels they're starting to become tight on that which you know it's like hey bro i mean if it's growing it's growing i'm surprised youtube <laughs> is cracking down i gotta look into it to figure out why but so people are getting around that now by hiring voiceover people from fiverr Right, so you still don't have to do it. You just have, to, and you actually do have to pay somebody. Mm-hmm. But if the channel grows and it pops big enough, you're good. Yeah. All right. And again, this is I didn't have to spend any time creating content. I'm just getting content paraphrased from other places. That shit's genius, bro. <laughs> bro, I was genius. like, oh shit, it makes so much sense now. Before I'm like, oh, this is weird as hell. But now I know what they're attempting to do. I thought you were just. I don't know, wasting your life, <laughs> like like <laughs> uploading this. Like, what are you doing? Okay, you trying to make money. It makes sense. That's a popular thing right now, bro. There be uh, these videos on TikTok going viral where it'll be like a robotic voice reading a Reddit thread, and there there'll be a game of Subway Surfer or something at the bottom. I've caught myself watching a handful of those videos. I don't know what it's it is, right man. Topic. Something something about the monotoneness of the of the robotic voice. <laughs> You know, you think it's sexy, bro? I don't know. It do, it do something to me. I ain't gonna lie to you, bro. And I just be like, man, like I could, I could listen to this story about, I don't know, what it be stupid shit, bro. Those Reddit stories be crazy. Oh yeah, oh yo, yeah. oh, I know what you're talking yeah, about now. I, yeah, it, it just clicked. <laughs> yeah, I think it's hard. I'm not gonna even fully get that to the voice. Just because those stories are so crazy, you could be hooked in and, yeah. and not even care what's going on. You just want to know how this shit ends. But I was gonna say that shit is actually genius because. You go to the Reddit thread, bro, and it's like, that shit is just right there. It clicked as soon as I said that, bro. That shit is wild. It's right there. It's right there. See? So then that makes me say, hey, maybe I need to start copying Reddit threads. Yeah. And then get a voiceover actor from Spotify, uh, from Fiverr. That shit will probably go on my phone. I might look it up. (laughs) Just straight up tell all the stories and let the channel grow. 
That's yeah. crazy. Well, that shit might get started tonight. Hey, that <laughs> means it's such an easy, easy business. It's, a, it's such an easy flip if you can get it to work. You know what I mean? Of course, there's a barrier, but once things are moving like that, man. And you had issue at that point, then you just get a little intern to now be the person who finds the stories and uploads. Yeah, that's look. That might be the wave, man. It might be the wave. It might be the wave. Yeah, I can't remember whose YouTube video I saw, but it's probably like two days ago. I saw him talking about he like he tried the YouTube automation channel mm. or whatever. So I was like, dang, okay, okay, I see it. So you know, hey, artists, y'all looking to make a little side money or try a little something. <laughs> Right, get some Reddit stories your, up. Yeah, to add to your campaign money, get at it. Try that's a pretty low risk, you know, thing to to try. You and until you probably hit a thousand subscribers, of course, you got to invest to get in it. But man, the level of effort that's you want to try to get some easy money. I'm not a big proponent of like saying you know, money come easy, <laughs> but man, that sounds like one of the easiest things I heard in a minute. <laughs> yeah, bro, it's gonna be boring as fuck at first, but yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? Growing pain. Yeah, growing pains. That's part of business. <laughs> That's part of business. So, <laughs> hey, y'all, we appreciate y'all rocking with us yet again for another episode. Uh, of course, every Tuesday and Thursday, mm-hmm. be here. You know what I mean? Be here. We are dropping new episodes of No Labels Necessary. We would love to hear y'all feedback about these episodes in the comments. We try to stay engaged with y'all or at least use some of that as inspiration for future episodes. But until then, I'm Sean. I'm Corey. And we out. Peace. Peace.